Hey everybody. So I was in a synth shop the other day and I was messing around with the Make Noise O Coast uh, as well as its sequencer, the O Control. And uh, let me show you that sequencer. So it's kind of Euro rackish. I don't know if you can put it in a Euro rack case. It's like a standalone thing. And it is this eight step sequencer where you can do lots of things, one of which is control the length of each step using this row of this bottom row of dials here. So when the knob is all the way to the left, the step is very short, and when the knob is all the way to the right, it's very long. And then it has this other knob over here on the left that you can use to scale the entire scale all of them basically. Uh, either they're very short or very long. And it's cool because you can go from uh, very, very fast, like audio rate, so that you actually end up kind of using this to generate an oscillation um, that is like a tone or rhythm. And um, you get some pretty wonky patterns. And this is pretty similar to what we've done in the other video with the swing. Um, really very similar, but um, just kind of thought of in a little bit of a different way. So I wanted to basically make... Uh, just this capability, so not all the rest of this thing, but just this capability in Max. And so this is what I came up with, and we'll we'll patch it, but first I'll show you. So So in the middle here we have the dials in question. And you see as I make them longer, we get longer events, and the shorter ones we get shorter events. And in fact, I have a little visualizer which is not currently visible, but will be now. And um, I'm doing that in Gen. So we have a phaser going to Gen, which is actually producing these little subdivisions. And that's driving a uh, an envelope coming from shape. And it's also selecting pitches that we have stored in stash that are then being fed into a little synth that I've made that's kind of like an 8-bit kind of thing. So we have like some wave shaping and bit crushing and things like that. Um, oh, and let me show you the scale all. So as I turn this up, they get longer, but as I go low, we can get really fast. And I also have actually a little um, Portamento pitch slide, which has an interesting effect on that tone or it can just be your classic logarithmic sliding you can also use ramp smooth but I don't know slide is fun cool all right so let's make this so I'm going to leave a couple of things in place I'm going to leave the synth I'm going to leave the whole envelope section down here so really um I'm just going to delete all of this and I'm gonna add this bang back that I need to get the envelope to work okay and we have our very traditional phaser in transport which is pretty much always the source of timing in these patches and let's just restart making these things so first off I'm gonna make a matrix control which was our sort of bank of dials matrix control. I'm going to give it one row and eight columns and I'm going to set this dial mode to two which is going to allow the object to create these dials. If I don't give it that argument they're just a bunch of toggles and I'm going to add this message get row zero that we're going to attach to the first outlet of the object because anytime I do anything with those dials it's going to give me some message I don't care really what that message is. I just want to use it to trigger this get row zero message. 
to tell the object to output for me a list of values. And what we're going to do with these values is store them in a buffer, which is very similar to storing them in a stash object, like you can see over here, in which we've done in so many of these videos. Um, but we're actually building this sequencer in Gen, um, mainly because there are some situations where we need to do uh, what you might call disintegration and integration. So taking the um, taking a phaser ramp, uh, using a delta object to get its slope performing some modifications to that slope, and then re-adding those values back up to create new ramps, um, which are the kinds of things, if you've watched the swing video, you saw we were able to do an MSP, but it's really easier in gen, particularly because you can uh, you can do feedback very easily in gen. You can take a value and feed it back into something. Um, so we're, we're going to do that. And what that means is in order to basically be able to access this list of values, we need to store them into a buffer. So we're going to create that buffer. We're going to call it lengths. And I'm going to set it to just one millisecond in length to start with uh, one channel. But then I'm going to use this samps argument um, to overwrite the length to in, in samples. So when we create a buffer by default, the first uh, the, the first argument is the name, the second argument is the length in milliseconds. Um, but I actually don't even want it to be that long. I want it to be so so short, 256 samples. So I'll use this samples uh, uh, attribute to set it to 256 samples in length. So now if I uh, create a uh, poke object, then I'm going to be able to take this list and put it into the buffer. And in order to do that, we'll create a list funnel, which is going to break this list of eight items up into eight two-item lists, where the first item is the index and the second item is the value. And then I'll use a zeal nth to do two things at one time. One is unpack the list, so break it into two separate numbers coming out of these two outlets, but it'll also reverse it at the same time so that we get first the index from the right outlet and then we get the value from the left, um, which is typically what we want with poke. Okay, and if I create a waveform object so we can actually see what is inside of that buffer, so we'll say waveform at buffer name lengths, and you can see it's showing us the whole buffer which is uh, pretty short. It's only 256 samples long. Um, and if I simply draw some values, you can see we're getting some stuff over here on the way left. It's showing us the whole buffer though, and you really kind of probably only want to see the region that we're actually, that is actually visible to us, so 8. Uh, and by the way, the reason I've gone with 256 here is because I want to be able to configure, I want to be able to customize the length of the sequencer. Um, and so in order to do that, let's add ourselves a little parameter. So we'll add a number box here. I will set its minimum to 1, maximum to 256. And then we'll be able to pass a columns message into the, into the matrix control, which will change the number of sliders that we have, or the number of dials that we have. And then what we can also do is uh, uh, use a translate object to take this value, which is a number of uh, samples, as the buffer understands it, and convert it into milliseconds, and then pass that into, I believe, the second inlet here of the waveform object. And that will actually change the length that it actually shows us. It just wants that in milliseconds. So we're going to send this value 0 0.18. And I actually know from experience it actually, for some reason, wants one more sample than that. So now if I modify this last one, you can actually see that that value is changing. Cool. So this is nice for sort of sanity purposes that we can see what's happening in here. The other thing, by the way, that I'm going to do is change this uh, waveform offset to 1. Is that what I want? No. I want the vertical offset to be 1. Um, and the vertical zoom is going to be 0 0.5 so that we're really seeing those on their full possible range, right? So this waveform 
object is showing us only the range of 0 to 1. Okay. So that's uh, basically all of that. So now we have stored these values inside of a buffer. And now we just need to be able to use them to kind of subdivide this phaser, which I will show you. We needed to subdivide that phaser and do it in a way that's sort of irregular. So. Let's create a gen patch. We're going to give it a title, which is going to be step mod or something. And we'll pass the phaser into it. And we're not going to need that second inlet. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a parameter, which we're going to call steps. And we'll set the default to eight. And the minimum is going to be one and the maximum is going to be 256. And then we'll prep a message box so that we can change that. And I'm going to send it through just to be careful. And then let's also declare the buffer that we're going to be using, which I think we called lengths, yes. And a peak object, which is what we're going to use to look inside of that buffer. So this buffer we're just going to put over here because we just need it in the patch to be able to use that buffer. And then what we'll do next is um, use a delta object to disintegrate the incoming phaser. So that now the value that we receive from it is some super small value, just slightly above uh, zero. And in fact, we actually are going to get, if I throw a scope in here, and I change the range to negative one to one. Sometimes it's gonna go into the negative territory in a way that we can solve that problem, which I learned from the Go book, is to just wrap negative five, 0 0.5. There's also a thing where you can tell it when the value is less than zero to look back, but this is such a, just a, a, an easy way to do it. That This is how I normally do it now. And then what we're gonna do is multiply that slope by this steps value. So now you can see if you watch here, that value has gone up. So if I take this back out, it's small. And now it's slightly less small. And now if I were to take another one of these wrap objects, right? Um, which is very much like the Pong object in wrap mode in Max or in MSP, but it's a dedicated operator here in Gen, and I say wrap 0, 1, and then I feed the input of that wrap object back into, I'm sorry, I feed the output back into its input through this history operator, which allows us to achieve feedback by introducing a single sample delay. What we're doing here basically is adding up every, we're adding up those values and wrapping them around zero and one. Perhaps to make this thing a little bit more transparent to see exactly what's happening, we could do this. So we basically add together some new slope value plus uh, the, the history, the accumulated history of all the slopes that we've added up. And every time we get a result of that, we pass, feed it back around. Um, much like in MSP and in Gen, we don't really need this plus object. We can just do this, and it will know to add them. So we'll just do that. So you can see here that we're getting literally the exact same thing, actually, as if we were simply to do this. Taking the initial phaser, uh, multiplying it by steps, and then wrapping it around 0 in 1, or even just taking the modulus of 1. It's the same thing in this particular case. Oops, I need to send this to out too. There we go. And I'm going to change both of these so that they're on the range of uh, 0 to 1. There we go. So you can see that those are identical. So why do we do all this complicated stuff in here? Well, the reason is because we're going to use this to, uh, to scale that slope some more in order to achieve this rate modulation. So in fact, if I, if I add that in here, 
and then I um, just patch the output of the length's peak object in. And I'll send that to our out2 so that you can see what that value is. It's actually the first value in our list here because by default the peak object is looking for item 0 or the first item in the buffer called lengths which we can see here we can also see it here so it's this first value which is here okay and so you can see we're already scaling the lengths of those phasers so I can make them longer now you'll you'll notice that this is kind of reversed from what we want right we wanted it to be so that when the value is all the way to the left things get shorter so the way we'll solve that problem is by instead of multiplying here we'll divide so now it's really fast Or we could have it be long. And I wonder is does it matter if I put this here or here? Let's find out. Yeah. So it doesn't, by the way. But anyway. I think it kind of makes more sense to have it here just cognitively. And right now these values that are stored in the buffer are on the range of 0 to 1, but we actually kind of want that range to be something more like 0 to 2 or something, right? Because the value of 1 is going to play it at the same speed, so in this case we can only make them shorter than they actually are. So I'm just going to multiply this by 2. If we wanted, we could create a, a, ra a, um, a range parameter or something and, and set that value equal to whatever the range is. But in this case, we'll just use two. And now this allows us to make those longer, assuming that I've done something correct here. Yes. So this would be the normal length at one, and then that's twice as long. OK, so now we need to be basically be able to advance through the pattern so that we're not always picking the first value. And the way that we're going to do that um, is to take first off, instead of wrapping between 0 and 1 and getting this subdivided phase, we're actually going to wrap between 0 and steps. So that now, if I were to change this scope so that it's looking at the range of, let's say, uh, negative 1 to 9, you can see that it's a ramp that goes from 0 to 8. If I then simply take that output, and actually we could give this a name, it's like the current step, right? This is like our, our current location in the pattern and the history operator, we can name it. And I can then just patch that right around like this. I could also create another history object called current step. and and send that in. It would be the exact same thing. And so now you can see that we already have this really kinked kind of wonky looking phaser. If we then take the result of our, our wrapping around 0 and steps and just wrap that around 0 and 1, then at that point we start to get these weird modulated phasers. We can also then create a new outlet. Let's create two new ones. So we'll create out two and out three. From out three, we'll actually pass that current step value. And we'll pass it through a floor operator first so that we're not getting the decimals. We're just getting the actual step that we're on. And eventually what we'll do is use that to uh, create a little visualizer that sits on top of the matrix control and shows us what step we're on. Um, but we'll, we'll also take the output of that final subdividing or final wrapping and use that to get an impulse. So this is something very similar to like what the what object does. It's going to turn the end of each of those um, 
ramps into an impulse. And we can then use that to advance our stash so that we get the pitch values. And then we're just going to pass the subdivided ramps into the shape object here. And you can, you can hear that that's working. Okay, so we're getting pretty close here. I think the only really two things that we have to do is first is create this knob that uh, the oak control has that controls all of the, basically scales the whole thing so that you can take the whole pattern and make it all faster or all slower, which is cool, and then add a little visualizer. Um, let's start with the visualizer. So to do that, I'm gonna just, uh, use a live um, grid. And when I use this, I always pretty much go into the help patch and I go to this matrix tab and steal this one over here. And I'm going to switch it so that it only has one row. Uh, it's convenient in that it takes this same columns message that the matrix control takes. And I'm going to make most of its colors transparent because we really don't want to see it other than the red kind of semi-transparent highlighting that we get when we pass an integer into the object, which I'll show you in a second. And it's basically going, this is going to act as our visualizer of what step we're currently on. So it oh, looks like I still have something I need to undo here, this one. Okay, so the only the only real uh, color that's activated is this highlighted background color. And if I send an int in there, you can see that we actually we highlight that color. So from this third outlet, we're going to get um, a step that we're currently on, which is going to be on the range of 0 to 7. We're going to add 1 to that because the live.grid wants it to be on a range of 1 to whatever, 1 to 8 or however many steps we have. Uh, and then we'll take a snapshot and convert that to an int because the snapshot's going to give us a float, but the live grid wants an int. And so now if I start this, you'd see it bounces along. And then I'm just going to lay this on top so that it lines up. And maybe we want to go with white. So now we have a much better sense of what is going on. And I'm just going to encapsulate here and we'll call this view. And did we send the, yes we did, we sent the columns message. So now even as the number of columns changes, this thing works correctly. And actually we revealed an issue which is that when the value is zero, um, it doesn't know what to do. So we need to add a little clip object here. And in fact, we don't really need a clip because we only care about the minimum. So what we'll do is we'll say maximum 0 0.01 so that basically if the value is below 0 0.01, it'll output 0 0.01. If it's greater than that, it will output what it's received. So that's just a, mat a way of kind of solving that problem. So now if we go up to say 16, it's going through that last eight super fast, like faster than the um, than um, the object can even display for us. Okay, so that part is done, and now let's do this other uh, this last bit, which is this other knob. So let's create a live dial here. We'll just ignore the name and I'm going to come down here. I'm going to change the unit style to float. I'm going to set it to a range of, um, let's just say zero to one. So we'll do like a normalized range inside of the actual object, but then we'll handle the scaling in the gen patch. So now as I move this, I get our value between zero and one. And I'll create a message. We'll call it, I don't know, scale all. 
and then we'll pass that into gen. And then inside a parameter, which we'll call scale all. And the default, let's say, will be 0 0.5, and it'll be on a range of 0 to 1. Actually, I'm rethinking my decision here. I think what we'll do is be a little more transparent. So I'm going to set this to a range of 0 to 2, and I'm actually going to add an exponent here so that the actual value that it, the object shows is the actual value that the gen patch is using. So we'll make the default 1, and the minimum is going to be 0, and the maximum will be 2. And then what we will simply do is just multiply the result by that value. Um, or, in fact, actually, an even better way to do this may be to use a scale object. So we'll say scale 0, 1, scale 0, and then whatever this ends up being. So if the default is going to be uh, 1, then let me think about this. I think we want to add one here so that we can go between, if the value was 1, then the range of these is 0 to 2. If the value was 2, then the range of these is 0 to 3. If it's, say, 0 0.5, then the range is 0 to 0 0.5. So we're shortening or lengthening or whatever. Let's test that. That seems to be working, but I kind of want something a little more dramatic. So I think I'm going to do it this way instead. Oh, that's crazy. Where we just multiply the result from the lengths buffer by that scale all parameter. And this allows us to kind of get into crazy, like, audio rate territory. But if I set it to 1, I still get the normal thing. And I'm going to take this exponent away as well, which I thought would be a good idea, but isn't. I think that's everything. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. and. Yeah, play around this with this and happy patching. See you later. Bye.